Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sports Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soups. Time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe, please, or interview the program. I'm your host, Wayne Lou. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Blake, how you doing, man? I'm great. What a what a night in sports. Uh, baseball didn't happen last night. There's no such thing. <laughs> uh, we didn't have that? to. Uh, the NBA did us a favor, and there was not. I mean, Devin Booker went off, but that's uh-huh. about it. The only really NBA relevant thing for this show is Memphis won, so the Raptors get a great. little bit of extra insulation. But my God, the quality of those two Elite Eight games yeah. in the women's bracket. Caitlin Clark against LSU, Paige against Juju. We've got an unbelievable Final Four set up now, but two incredible basketball games last night. Yeah, look, this is obviously what everyone was watching yesterday, and for good reason. I was just locked in in front of the TV for five hours uh, yesterday evening. The first game, Caitlin Clark ultimately beats LSU. It, it feels disrespectful to, to Iowa in general, but it's, come on, it's Caitlin Clark overcoming uh, last year, um, avenging the loss to LSU. Kaylin makes nine threes, has 12 assists, um, is just absolutely dominant. I think, you know, just just seeing how poised she was throughout the entire match, um, even though there's so much pressure, even though there's so much, like, um, emphasis to perform, and I think that's something that Holly Rowe, the, the reporter, um, was giving the, the scoop about, like, you know, everyone else sort of, like, feels and understands this, and Kaylin even acknowledges that, like, there's this big desire to perform, and there's a big expectation, but she actually doesn't get nervous at all, hmm. which sounds like it's like one of those like uh, it, it, basically you've only ever heard like these stories about Kobe and like Michael Jordan, like these like mythologized sort of like I can't believe they can, you know they operate in this fashion. But then when you see them play, it's like yeah, actually that's actually how Caitlin operates. Like no concerns, no like nothing about being shy. Just competed throughout the whole thing. She opened each half with a ridiculous three of just exactly. like yeah. statement right yeah. away. Oh, if there was any concern that I might be nervous, bang, 25 yeah. footer. Yeah. And I, I just, um, it, it was just an incredible feeling to, to watch that match. I think obviously LSU is, is a uniquely difficult opponent for them because they have so many bigs and they're very athletic and they're able to, you know, really dominate the class. I mean, Actually, when I watched it, I was like, huh, they're doing a decent job on the glass. Nope. <laughs> 23 <laughs> offensive rebounds for LSU. And, of course, you know, when you have the possession game tilted to that fashion, you need something spectacular to beat them. And, and last year, Caitlin had, like, 30 against them. But this time, 41. Uh, yeah, your thoughts, Blake. I just – it was just such a fun game to watch. It's – yeah, it was a, an incredible game to watch. Again, the the opening each half with a huge three. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved, you know, the toughness that Angel Reese showed coming out of that game with an apparent knee injury at one point. Right. Hopping on the bike. She gets back in there and immediately demands a post-touch yep. of, like, I'm back in this game. Let me get back in this game. Uh, Morrow played the whole 40. Um, it, there were just – there were so many really good individual performances like that. But, like, the main thing I come away with is – Caitlin Clark is an offense unto herself. Like, it's the closest thing to Steph at Steph's peak that we've seen where her, like, like even, like, she had 41 points last night when 9 of 20 on threes. Even if that hadn't been the case, if she hadn't been quite that good, maybe they put Flo J on her at some point to to mix up the matchup or whatever. We'll talk about that in a second, yeah. Um, Like, even if she hadn't been quite that good, the offense gets a good look every time down the floor because of the immense gravity that she has. And, like, she comes up, like, 41 with 12 assists is crazy. She produces almost all of the offense via shot or pass. And then, like, I don't know, we I don't think they count the, like, secondary assists Mm -hmm. um, in college basketball. But if they did, there would be a handful of those as well because at least two people are – focus on Caitlin Clark the entire possession, mm-hmm. and that creates all these imbalances uh, around the floor. And this is an Iowa team this year that's better able to take advantage of that than the version last year that that lost in this spot. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really great point because obviously this is that big testing game, right? Like I, I know they still have to win uh, a, f- a few more to, to ultimately get to their, their big goal. But at the same time, it's like, you know, the, the team performance was stronger. Having said that, though, Caitlin Clark created 73 points. Crazy. Of the team's 94. Like, and, like, it's a oh, night after man. we saw Zach Eady <laughs> basically do the same thing, but, yeah. like, they could not be in more, like, diametrically opposed oh, sure, style, sure, right? Like, sure. like, they're the complete two opposite ways to dominate an offense and have an mm-hmm. offense run uh, around you. It's really... It's really cool. I, and I don't know, on the LSU side, like, again, the Angel Reese toughness. I know she didn't shoot the ball that she well. She started really well. And yeah. I felt like, okay, you know what? Because uh, LSU threw that first punch. They were up. And then, or no, Iowa threw that first punch. And then LSU came back. And a lot of that comeback was just giving the ball to Angel Reese and, and her being able to use her height, use her skills in the post and score that way. But 
I don't know. After that knee injury, I just felt like she wasn't as involved in the offense. And then also her touch on, you know, around the glass just wasn't as strong. Yeah, the, the touch was tough. Like, LSU shot 39% for the game and 33% on threes. And, and I know that, like, the threes aren't ever Like, in college ball, you can manufacture. Like, you don't have to keep up in the three-point rates necessarily the yeah, way, yeah, like, sure. you're going to have to. I mean, with if Bach you get 23 with- offensive rebounds and you have that many uh, low post scores, exactly. then yeah, for sure. You- exactly. Um, but, yeah, the fact that, you know, 23 offensive rebounds in part because you shot so poorly when you did get inside and you did get those opportunities um, is a little tough. And, like, look, obviously LSU did a ton of good things. They're an incredibly yeah. good team. But at this level, when you're in the Elite Eight and this is punch you to get to the Final Four and, like, UConn's waiting on the other side and stuff mm-hmm. um, and South Carolina after that, like, yeah, you have one game where a couple of your, you know, one of your bigs and, and – um, you know, Williams shot the three really well, but anything inside the paint was, was nothing. Like you can't, you can't miss the easier ones in at, yeah. at a level like this. And you know that that kind of that kind of was it. That well, that was that was one half, right? Offensively, I think obviously LSU could have done better, but I think defensively they also <laughs> could have done way better because I do feel like, look, it, the way you would manage this game. I mean, it's it's really one player with like some good supporting cast, you know, like. Not to dismiss the rest of Iowa's team, but like realistically, LSU has multiple players and multiple options, and you just never felt like you got into the best defensive scheme you possibly could have against Kaylin. Not to say you would ever shut down Kaylin; she would probably still generate lots of offense. But if you could help hold her to, I don't know, thirty and nine rather than like forty-one and twelve, that might have been a difference in this game. And obviously, the big talking point is just like I mean, people realize this as the game was going on, but Haley Van Lyth was just not able to. To, to do much with this whole situation. She was not. And, she uh, ended up on every meme. I feel really bad for her. Yeah, like, and like, uh, you know, I, I can't do the, I'm not going to do the the eye roll as well as Kia did. But yeah, it was an obvious thing, at, like even at the halftime panels and things like, like, they needed to mix it up. And like, it's especially tough because, I mean, first of all, you start to feel bad at a certain point when, when Caitlin Clark is doing that. Um, but also like, this is a team that knows Caitlin Clark and knows Iowa and had lots of yeah, prep yeah. for the, like, I would have thought we saw more like like generally at this level at these levels what we hear coaches say is like okay well at least we're going to mix up the coverages and give them a different look and try to get them out of their comfort zone like we've seen we've seen Nick Nurse do that tons of times right where it's like part of the star stopping strategy was like we're just gonna throw a bunch of stuff at them and none of it might like maybe none of it works but maybe seeing different things is going to take take you out of your comfort zone or, or whatever. we're going to hard to double you and trap you yeah. and just do everything possible. Like, again, like, this is a good point. If Nick coached LSU last night, yeah. this would have been a very different outcome. But Yeah, yeah go it would have been box and one, but probably, like, not even triangle. The boxes around Caitlin, not yeah, the one. <laughs> it's, it's a triangle and two, but the two people are both on Caitlin. Yeah, honestly, um, you probably could have And honestly, like, with LSU's, like, size and, and uh, you know, the advantage they had inside, you really could have probably gotten really aggressive on Caitlin on the mm-hmm. perimeter and just trusted that you had the the size inside to to recover and, yeah. and contest and stuff. Um, but look, this is like Caitlin Clark just bends teams that way. Yeah, I I, I know, but I I just feel like okay, you you could have obviously they they finally made this switch with like five minutes left in the game. It was like okay, Flo J, you're gonna have to go guard her, and you know you saw Andrew Reese like really actively like you know almost preemptively coming out and and and, and blitzing a couple of times. And you saw like Caitlin, okay, one or two times she's like, okay, I got to adjust to this. And then she figured it out to a certain degree. But it's like, you would have loved to see that le- better than like five minutes left in the yeah. game. You yeah. know? And like, if you knew that that's yeah. something you were willing to turn to with five minutes left and with 10 or 15 that minutes left. right after time, like half time. You know what yeah. I mean? You know? It's, uh, yeah. it's not like Caitlin Clark snuck up on you. No. And I, I also, the thing that I don't feel bad for Haley about is just offensively. She was just taking some of the shots. She had no rhythm at all. She was just getting cooked all the game on defense, and it's like, at least bring it back on offense. And she just, yeah, it's it's very unfortunate. She was struggling with post-entry passes yeah. at one point. It, it just was a lot. And they're, like, yeah. they're a deep team through their start, but, like, they only play six players. Yeah. So right, you can't, right. like, there's not really an option to, to go away from that. You could have gone away from the assignment, but, like, they're not going to win yeah. many games at, against elite, elite opponents. Like, mm-hmm. they're going to beat Iowa, UConn, South Carolina unless Van Lith is having a good – like, they need everyone because every team does sure, at, at, this, sure. at this yeah. point in the game. Um, what did you think of the other game? I know we, we got to get the damn Wakey here, but uh, yeah, yeah. the other one was really fun too with, with Paige against Juju. No, the other game was also really fun. Um, I just think for, for Paige, I think she entered – uh, collegiate basketball was like incredible amounts of hype and then it kind of like died down a little bit not even necessarily based on her performance but 
you saw it in this game. It's just a complete performance. She scores from all over the court. She has a really, really good sense of sort of how to run and control tempo of the whole game without, like, holding on to the ball. She's really good at knowing when to be on and off the ball. And again, she just, like, pops up wherever you want. Like, baseline out of bounds play, you know, short inbound, 10-foot baseline jumper, she'll knock that down. A pull-up three, she'll knock that down. Take it to the rack, she'll do that as well. And then she scraps and competes on the other end, too. Ten rebounds, for guard. The fact that she really, really likes to play defense, too. It, it just, I thought UConn, like, this is not the stacked UConn teams that we're super used to, right? They're not even the number one seed. But, like, her and Aaliyah Edwards, just the two of them together gave them such a good structure that even though not the rest of the teammates didn't even step up like that, they just, they competed hard, but they didn't really, like, contribute as much in the scoring. But those two, just in general, was able to overcome, like, what like uh, we we all know the next like collegiate stars gonna be Juju. Yeah, like, of Juju course she's eighteen crazy. still. She's eighteen, so she took twenty five shots in that game. And like I get it, you shoot nine of twenty five. It's not the yeah. the best stat line, but like they needed every one of those field goal attempts. Right. Like they are already you know f running a lot mostly through her and Forbes. But like she is going to be the star of that program. And like if you were going to pick, you know, w with with Caitlin and Aaliyah and uh, Angel all going to the WNBA this year. Uh, if you were going to pick a team to be the one seed next year right now, yeah. probably pick a USC because she's phenomenal already. And, like, yeah. we we know how this goes, right? Like, on your way to becoming a superstar, most people take a lump at some point. Yeah, you, sure. you run up against UConn and you yeah, lose yeah. in a game where you would have liked to be more efficient. I know she was efficient overall. I think she got, with UConn, exactly. Know, in the same position. Yeah. Um, you know, and, like, I know she got the line a lot, but she'll look at nine, nine for 25, and, like, that'll be part of her story next year when she's, yeah. again, she's still only 18. She's, like, a young freshman um, yeah, future is very, very, very bright there. Um, it's crazy how shifted she is, man. The I footwork, the way yeah. she's able to get to her shots, like everybody's just off balance when they guard her. That's how you know she's a, such an amazing offensive player. Yeah, it's it's really cool to watch. Um, and my main takeaway from these last couple games is UConn was really underseeded as a three seed. Like they're yeah, they're good. Probably man. yeah. They're also, they're, one they're of also the, really short handed too. Yeah, a lot of and, injuries. And still, they're one of the only teams that is playing seven players <laughs> instead. Like everyone ah. has shortened their rotation so much at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, a you know fully what? Healthy. Nick would kill it in women's basketball for sure. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, we're gonna bring in Dan Wykey, uh, yeah. uh when, Wednesday, by the way, uh, that that starts back up. There you go, Dan. Um, I, I know you've been on the line for like five minutes, man. Do you, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I've been listening, I've been enjoying. I do have thoughts. Um, I, can I uh, can I explain this to a, a little different thing? Um, my big takeaway of yesterday, because I'm negative, generally speaking, is how the NBA and men's college basketball have like totally dropped the ball because like it was so fun to watch like actual college stars in like a real mm -hmm. meaningful way. Like with um, like, like there were rivalries, there were, you know, there was history. Yeah. Um, you, we like, I wasn't introduced really to any of these people. I mean, outside of Juju um, and you know, like we could be talking about, Oh man, like, you know, this is Chet Holgren and Zach Eadie's like third battle. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was some version of that. And that was, you know, um, because obviously I like you watch Juju and you're like, that's a pro, right? Mm -hmm. Like she could go pro tomorrow. Um, and she would be fine. And but like the rules don't allow for that. And with NIL money and stuff like that, like she is going to be plenty compensated to stay in college. Like, is doesn't everybody kind of come out ahead? Because, like, think about the excitement that, like, we're all going to have, you know, for Indiana Fever games next year mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We know these stars in a way that, you know, when you compare it to what we look at in this NBA draft and, um, you know, kind of the men's tournament this year, we're really, like, I feel like I'm just sort of being introduced to a lot of these people. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a great point because that's, that's what, um, well, obviously, March Madness, but even the whole entire collegiate season, like, it does create this like incredible vehicle to to uh, tune in to watch the product mm -hmm. and, and they get introduced to these people and you know I, I, i'm not against like players like getting their bag overseas we, we've seen a lot of creative like basically skip that one year right we've seen like uh Dar yeah. darius basically like took a new balance like <laughs> internship internship, internship. Yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. or like go to australia brandon or... jennings was kind of the first one to, to go yeah. over i think he played in italy right like yeah. the, the, the the ball family is probably the most infamous example of this where they send lamello to like lithuania you know what i mean or like overtime elite all these kind of things and it's like yeah sure I, i'm sure social media can bridge a lot of this gap but like i don't know man there is something about like you play in college you really get known with the program you grow with it 
it does kind of raise your stock quite a bit. I mean, the women's, yeah, the women's, the women's product is the women's product is so much better than the men's product. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and I think that was really crystallized yesterday. And I mean, that wasn't even the final four. Right. Those were two elite eight games. And I mean, it, it did sort of break perfectly. It did. You know, yeah. um, but I, it, it, that was one of the takeaways for me, in addition to obviously, you know, what you guys talked about and like, you know, how great Caitlin Clark was and, you know, how tough Angel Reese was. And mm-hmm. obviously, you know, Paige Beckers and Juju Watkins, just incredible players. But like, I think that was the other thing I kind of was left thinking about was just sort of like, you know, like it feels like a real sea change in that way that yeah. as college basketball continues to get diluted with like, you know, all of these other pathways and, and people leaving so early. I mean, you know, if you have a good freshman season, like you don't come back. There's no, yeah. there's no incentive to come back in the, in the, in, you know, college basketball, the money is so big and stuff like that. But like, that's just not how the women's game is. And, and quite frankly, I kind of think that they're going to be better. for. It. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, um, now that you have NIL, like you can actually kind of do both. Totally. You can make a lot of money. It's also, there's an element here too, where like, because you don't make as much money professionally on the women's side as you do on the men's side. And like, yeah, we, we all want better salaries for WNBA players and things like that. But the contrast Mm -hmm. is not as strong, right? Like, like the male players can get NIL deals, but a rookie scale contract, if you get picked in the first round is like a couple million guaranteed. And you can't quite do that. You know, you can't cobble that together with NIL. And I think that, you know, there's not a solution to this. Like, like you, the only the only way to legislate this kind of thing back into the men's game and not have it just like happen naturally is to anti-labor, right? Like it's, it's too restrictive to player movement and players earning what what they could potentially make and things like that. So you don't want to go down that path. So I think we're left to just like, like, yeah, the, the NBA and the men's side can try to crib from the, the momentum and the excitement the women's side has, but short of getting, like, you're not going to be able to incentivize top players to to stick around for a couple of years. The transfer portal is also like, wild on on the men's side yeah. now as well where, where you're tracking like i think every team in the elite eight had like at least one rotation player they'd picked up in the transfer portal um so i think we're left with we kind of are just going to have to appreciate the difference yeah. and, and like sure. it, it's a it's a strength and an asset oh. that the women's side is going to have that the men's side is just I like it's, they're not going to be able to replicate it and it's going to be an edge that women's basketball has yeah i really i really think that like if you're looking at trend lines right i mean like the trend line for women's college basketball is you know going up for men's it's you know probably going down a little bit and at some point they're going to cross mm-hmm. you know and we'll look i think at nights like last night and kind of maybe that is you know that's where a chapter of some really well-written book starts in there mm-hmm. that i will read in that right yeah all right well i mean it, it was really fun and yeah it was a night to, to sort of ignore the NBA in a way. So, actually, let, let me pivot to Lakers stuff uh, by, okay. by asking you this, Dan. Um, how mm-hmm. much have, like, you're around the Lakers, and we know LeBron is, like, the, the basketball fan to end all basketball fans outside of, of just his own day-to-day. Is the the excitement of Women's March Madness, are you seeing that resonate with NBA players as well? Like, are, are people, like, obviously you can't be quite locked in because you have games and stuff like that. Um, but sure. is, is it is it cutting through to the NBA side as well? I mean, we've heard LeBron talk a lot about Juju yeah. throughout the year, right? Like, I mean, that's someone he knows. I believe she went to Sierra Canyon High School, um, which is where Brownie went, um, I think. Um, but so very familiar with her game. Um, you know, we would, you know, probably less March Madness talk this year okay. than in years past. You do usually get a pretty hefty. I mean, like, you know, we had a nice chat with Anthony Davis about Kentucky after they lost. That was fun. <laughs> That was a fun conversation for me. Um, you know, like you have those kinds of chats, I think, like periodically, but like the the sort of uh, everybody gathered around the monitors, uh, it hasn't really happened. Now, part of that is is just been like sort of the nature of this road trip that they're on, right? Like we're uh, we're in city five right now of six. Um, it's been a it's been a long trip where I, I think you know we've been gone since the Sunday of March Madness, right? The first Sunday. So since the round of 32, so like it's lost a little bit of that in conversation, but I mean, look, I, I think there's no doubt that, you know, particularly NBA players, um, their support of, of, of women's basketball has grown and it will continue to grow. And, you know, we, we like, you know, it's probably worth asking LeBron about, about the game. Like that. I'm, I, I would bet anything that he probably watched it. 
Yeah. Well, um, it was really funny, by the way, watching along on social media, because that's what you do now, obviously. You're watching this game, but you're also looking at your phone. And, and yeah. so much of the people were realizing, it's like, I saw the sentiment shared quite a bit. I was like, oh, you know, women's basketball has really made it when you essentially have first take versions of <laughs> hot takes. And, and that sort of like yeah. very cynical lens on sports. And I'm like, I, I suppose that is one way of making it. But like, please, let's make it something different. But in any case, I saw a good tweet. Well, I mean, like, like, <laughs> I, like how, how good, like, honestly, like, how good is the, like, the analysis been oh, in this tournament? Unbelievable. Um, like, really strong, yeah. Yeah. like, like, you know, like, obviously, like, the shows, the shows in the U.S. have been really good. I had a great time watching the nurses. Yep. And yeah. Cat yesterday, like, like that was like such a nice treat for me. And um, I think that is like, there is, it, it, you just kind of sometimes end up talking a little more basketball. I know there have been other, there have been some veering on that, the like sort of the first takey sort of mm -hmm. topics on this stuff. But like, there isn't just a lot of, you know. The reductionary sort of like Caitlin Clark is great, but is it the best performance? Ever? Like we don't like have like yeah. those types yeah. of conversations yet about. It. We will eventually, I'm sure. To your point, like when like and then but that should be, be like the standard for making it is like you know you, no, you, you no, get you get turned oh, into a what, what, once we start once we start ruining it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, but like eventually, yeah, it will eventually get ruined. Uh, I'm sure. Well. Somebody yeah. who definitely got ruined by this, LeBron. No, I'm yeah. kidding. LeBron, Le LeBron has more than anyone else been at the very focal point in terms of just people making their whole career about sort of hitting LeBron and things like that. Uh, number one question with LeBron right now for a lot of fans in Toronto: Is he going to play? Are him and AD going to play tonight? First, let's start there. Yeah, I mean they've been listed questionable um, throughout the season. I my my hunch would be that LeBron James plays tonight okay. and does not play in Washington tomorrow that that would be kind right. of the way he would manage the back-to-back -back because they are um, they return home and they play three critical, critical home games. Um, they play Cleveland and Minnesota in a back-to-back, -back, and then they play the Warriors. Oh. And it is like if you kind of clear – you sort of clear that pathway. And, and LeBron's foot, he, he's been honest about it. Like, I mean, it's just – it doesn't really seem like a, a thing he's doing – on back to back nights, like right now. Um, so my guess is you play today and you buy the extra day's rest. Mm. That would be my hunch. But um I like they haven't made any formal decisions. It 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 would surprise me if he took the day off. If he did, it's because um something in Brooklyn didn't feel quite right. but that was a fairly low impact game. I mean he was I mean he didn't look hurt in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> did he hurt it? Did he hurt it fading away into the corner for three? Because that's the thing with LeBron is like he what hits... a bonker shot! What a bonker shot that was! Trust me, of all people, people in Toronto do not need to have that explained. You know what I mean? No. Because he just hits that point where he's like, "I'm so comfortable now. I'm just now. I'm just gonna here to test the limits of what I can get away with." And he's done that in playoff yeah. series. He did it the last time he was here. Like it, he did, it's yeah, he it's did. been so we were looking at the the game trying to refresh ourselves earlier. LeBron's only been here once since the championship season uh, for the Raptors because of the the pandemic and injuries and things like that. Uh, but yeah, the one game he played here, they they won in overtime and he hit a bunch of insane shots. It was yep. like, oh, it's 2018 again. Cool, great, yeah. love it, LeBron. Um, Okay, you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned those three pivotal games they have coming up. That uh, there, so after this Raptors yeah. Wizards back to back which has to rank among the, the lightest back-to-backs in league history uh, in terms of, like, quality of competition at this point okay. in the season. Yeah. Uh, like, they've, I don't know, combined, like, 2 and 25 over the last month. Um, then they have the Cavs, Timberwolves, and Warriors. And this is – we're running out of time here. This is a Lakers team that – is only a game and a half back of Sacramento now as Sacramento slides uh, because of injuries and things like that. They're also only three out of six, uh, which would allow them to get a little bit of extra rest and avoid the play in there. Is that kind of the, like, is that the talking point around the Lakers right now? Is they're trying to get the six or is it just get there healthy or? I think it's more to eight. I think honestly okay. it's get to seven or eight. Um, six, I think just from a tiebreaker standpoint. So they don't have a tiebreaker with the Kings. Um, they really fumbled. Um, they had, they had two games of Sacramento. It's, it's been a horrible match for them over the last couple of years, but in particular the, the, the first game, I, I, you know, I think they raced up to like something like an 18 point lead and they lost. Um, that, that was, a, and will be a critical, critical game. Um, you know, as these standings shake out, but like, like you mentioned it, I mean, you can kind of do the NFL sort of like win, win loss thing. You know, they've got, 
um, you know, let's say you win these two in the back to back and you win two of those three at home, um, you know, you're going to, and then you add in, you've got to, you end the year with at Memphis, which is not a, a difficult game. And then you go to new Orleans, which could be a very important game. Um, you split those. So that gets you to 47 wins, right? Like, great. Well, that, you know, that becomes sort of the target number. New Orleans is already at 45 wins, you know, so that, that doesn't seem like you can catch them, but the Suns maybe the Kings, maybe um, they do have the tiebreaker with the Suns. Um, that's kind of been the goal. It does feel like guys that if the season was 86 games, they'd be in a much better position. Mm-hmm. Like, it just kind of feels that way. Like, they, you know. Everyone's always saying the season should be longer and we should have more (laughs) regular season. Yeah, I know. This this is a very popular LeBron James thing. He wants more (laughs) regular season basketball. Um, I have some stats for you guys. Yeah. Um, I pulled these up. So, since the Lakers moved Rui Hachimura into the starting lineup on February 3rd, they're 17 and 8. Uh, They have the second best offense in the league. Um, They, uh, I think second or third, I'm sorry on that. Let me, um. Let me double check here. Third best offense in the league behind Boston and Dallas. Um, but they're second in effective field goal percentage, second in true shooting. Um, they are, you know, among the best passing teams in the league. Like the Hachimura stats guys, like is like a Ron Butler light style mm-hmm. role player offensively have been a third um, shooting 58.5% from the field. Yeah. You know, as a guy who, huge threes and mid-range jumpers and they, they figure out ways to get them in the post and mismatches. Um, you, you know, D'Angelo Russell has been terrific. He's at 41.8% from three during that stretch. Rui's at 44.7. LeBron James guys, 45.7% from three. Yeah. Well, I think like, this, it's crazy. Isn't he shooting a career best from three right now in his 21st yes. season? Yeah, like, he's, that's He's been awesome. Kind of inspirational. It's like, like he, we were having, I was having a conversation with Darvin Ham the other day about Rui and, kind of Rui's sort of emergence as one of their best catch and shoot guys. And I kind of like off panel, he said like, Oh, he may be your best catch and shoot guy. And then it's like, well, no, probably D'Angelo Russell. And I was like, well, maybe it's LeBron. <laughs> like it's yeah. just sort of like, True. which was kind of funny of that, you know, the, the conversation turned to like how much time he had left after the Brooklyn game, because I watched the game and like, I kind of had the opposite thought, which was like, if you're going to shoot like this, you know, mm-hmm. why couldn't you do this for another five years? Well, that's the thing that's incredible is it's like when players get old, when great players get old, especially players who at, at the start of their careers relied a lot on athleticism. Um, and obviously LeBron was like an athletic freak. Kind of still remains that, to be honest. Yeah. But it's like I remember even 10 years ago, it was like, well, he's got to develop that post game. That's going to help him transition and still pretty productive. And now it's like he's made a second transition. And it's just like I'm now an elite high volume three point shooter as well. And that's going to carry yeah, me for I, another stretch. And it's like, it's, you know, what it's do you really see a player testament- reinvent twice? It's really a testament to his work ethic, right? Like, and I think that does get sort of, I mean, he talks about it a lot. And I, and I think, but when we talk about LeBron James and sort of like, you know, the overall sort of story of his career, right? Like you talk a lot about how blessed he was. I mean, like he is like a freight train, right? Like he's gigantic. And you, we have never really seen a player combine force, size, speed and skill like all of those things i guess force is part of speed but like you know combining all three of those factors we've never seen it but like the skill part has continually evolved and you know he's changed not only with age but he's changed from mirror the nba um the the notion of lebron james being uh, a high volume 40 percent three-point shooter would have been absurd 15 years ago you know, like that just wasn't what he did at all. That was the way you, that was the way you stopped him was you forced him into this stuff. And and, and he said this the other day, like he still probably would pick that, but, but it's funny. It's, you know, watching him these last few years, like one of like the, I don't want to say sad or things, but like reminders of like mortality, right. Is like, you know, there'll be a moment where he'll get, he'll get a big switched on to him. And in the past, you, you know, it's a blow up. Mm-hmm. Right. Like he is going to take a Vita Zubats to the rack. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, now that possession ends with the step back a lot, mm-hmm. you know, and that is, I think both a recognition of like the, the fastball that he can't always throw, but like the change up he ought to develop. I'm staring at Roger Center, by the way, from my hotel room. <laughs> so I'm thinking <laughs> Yeah. We should invite you into the studio, honestly. We didn't yeah. know that you were in Toronto. 
Although it's very yeah, clear thanks, based on that, that painting of um, what looks to be bike lo bike racks behind you. <laughs> yeah, like that's a very iconic Toronto thing, those circular bike racks. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we do it here. Yeah. Uh, Guys, I have, a tr I, have a, I have a tremendous view of your city today oh, um, from good. my hotel. And uh, I wish it was sunny. But otherwise, I'm, it's uh, it's lovely. Well, uh, we're gonna get to see you down at the uh, down. At, I almost said down at the park. I'm, this is how you know I'm in baseball <laughs> mode now. Uh, we'll see yeah. you down at the arena uh, shortly. Thanks for taking the time out, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure, guys. Anytime for you. There you go, Dan Wojcik, LA Times. Yeah, all around good dude. All around good dude, man. I'm, I'm really excited to to chat with him. The last time I saw Dan Wojcik in Toronto at Scotiabank Arena as a fellow member of the media Final. was the finals. And uh, I was working at Sports Canada at the time. Our, our table was set up right beside LA Times. And all throughout the game, Dan Wykey was just so chill. Meanwhile, I'm just like, you know me during games. Yeah, I know you during games, yep. <laughs> I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And it's the NBA Finals, man. And he's just sitting there eating a pack of Jolly Ranchers. And he just went through that pack. And he was just not phased at all. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I do wonder if, if Dan uh, remembers that as well. So I'll, I'll ask him that later on. But um, before we go to the break, Time now for today's spicy take brought to you by new chunky spicy soup. Um, are you ready to get it fired up? Yeah, I am. Let's hear it. This is this is the take. Um, honestly, I, I think we were talking about this in the office earlier today, and the question was brought up like, you know, do you think LeBron will get a farewell tour and things like that? I think, for, number one, the, the league, the sponsors, everything will force him to have him do a, a farewell tour, but like, I, I think for me, honestly, and, and LeBron kind of spoke about this, you know, there's not so much time left. I actually think it will be a little bit too much to do a, a farewell tour. I think, like, there should be some special commemorative event by the league. You, I don't know what his final game is. You don't need the Derek Jeter gift basket at every stop kind of thing, though. Yeah, because I, I just feel like, you know, there's going to be certain markets and certain games where it's just like, all right, he's playing the Pelicans. And, like, what are they here to give them more like the charlotte hornets i think the difference here with like and it's not a, a hating lebron thing like obviously we just we clearly very much appreciate lebron based on what just happened but like the difference with the kobe one was like kobe has this like specific reverence where like people and, and players most importantly revered him for sort of what kobe stood for it was especially towards the end it wasn't just about what he was as a player or what he had done as a player which you can always objectively like debate the like actual accolades of what he did his resume as a player and you can compare it to other players, and that's why there's so much discourse around where he ranks all time, whatever. But in terms of where he is revered all time, he is much, much higher because, you know, the way he sort of, you know, stood for working hard and sort of that the mama mentality that I think a lot of athletes undeniably have gravitated towards. I think that's the one failure with LeBron's in terms of the marketing. It's just like, he's great. And it's like, he's great because, you know, Kobe somehow turned himself into like, he worked into becoming this, whereas LeBron felt very much like he was born yeah. like this. And that's not fair to LeBron because LeBron put in a ton of work into it. And also Kobe was like kind of born into it as well. Kobe like, was like way uh, more born into it. Let's like legacy yeah. basketball family and Even things the like that. circumstances of how he grew up. Yeah. Right. He was in a more, you know, a better And like, position. again, like with LeBron, yeah. that doesn't discredit the work. It's just funny how like the yeah, story, yeah. the the way the story has been presented or, right. or like over time has settled in. Right. So I, I, I just think that like, in terms of reverence, Kobe had it at a, at a higher level, whereas LeBron is just universally respected. Having said that, though, I think he's going to have a farewell tour, and, and I, I am going to. It is going to be mad awkward when whoever for the Raptors has to come down and be like, "Hey, thank you for LeBronto. Here's yeah. the, here's a. I don't. I, it's probably going to be Drake. Here's honestly. the Let's ball you spun in our face. <laughs> here's the wine you pretended to drink oh, uh, during a playoff game. Uh, yeah. Um, look, I, I don't the gifts uh, and stuff like that. Whatever. I will say with a player of LeBron's stature, and I would feel this way about Steph as well. Um, I at least but even want Steph is like revered, right? I, yeah. I'm just saying, sorry to your point about like the, the farewell tour or whatever. I just want to know if it's the last chance I have to see a guy. Yes, for sure. For so sure. at least that much. Um, well, he's, he's going to get one. This is, this is all yeah. relevant. I, I just think that there, there is a slight difference in terms of how it's going to be presented and sort of how they were both marketed at, at one time. But, um, yeah, hopefully we get to see LeBron tonight at the arena. Yeah. Hopefully. You know? Well, we'll see him. I don't, hopefully he plays. Um, yeah, yeah. He'll be there. True. Uh, let's take a break. Let's do and it. let's uh, talk about a documentary everyone should see. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so um, I've been your host, Will. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. 
Welcome back to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm Chris Wayne Lou. You'll be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Blake, who do we got for segment two? Yeah, we got a, a pal of mine uh, and a documentarian and director, uh, Jeremy Shalin Ryu, uh, multiple time Juno nominee and director of Handle with Care, the legend of the Nodic Streetball crew now streaming on Apple TV, on YouTube, a bunch of other places. The documentary has been nominated for uh, a bunch of awards. It won awards out at the Vancouver Film Festival. Jeremy, you're killing it, man. Welcome. Thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks so much for having me. A uh, fan of the show, fan of both your guys' writing. Excited to be here. Uh, well, welcome. Um, and yeah, so I guess you're you're a big basketball fan, and this is a so for anyone who hasn't seen the documentary, go see it. By the way, um, we were going to play a trailer, but I, I missed the cue for it, so uh, we're just going now. But obviously, it, you're a part of this story as well. So the story is about this streetball crew in the Vancouver area, but it's also about you and your co-director Kirk and how you guys got your start doing these like streetball mixtapes. Um, so, so have you been like lifelong? I, I know your your wife does WNBA podcast. Um, how much of this story is like about you, or like feels like very very personal for you, given your relationship with basketball as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the story feels super super personal to me. I think especially because like the time when we were originally making these mixtapes, when I was kind of me and Kirk were following around this amazing crew of guys that came to be called the Nautic. It was like 98, 2001. So I'm just finishing high school. This is like my coming of age. It's sort of their coming of age. So I think that like what happens to you around that era sort of defines a lot of who you are as a person. Like I still sort of talk like some of those guys. I, I try to walk like those guys. Like you can't help but sort of uh, follow kind of the, the people you looked up to at that time. So getting to make this documentary 20 years later, I feel like is really sort of like helping my life <laughs> get knocked into balance and sort of streetball and basketball. Like I, I, again, yeah, Katie makes WMA podcasts. I met her through basketball. Basketball is like the the lifeblood of, of everything I do in a weird way, even though I'm not kind of in a, in a professional way like you guys. Mm. Yeah, well, first off, I mean, this is something that I didn't fully appreciate and didn't wasn't really aware of sort of the importance of it. Even coming down to the studio today, I was asking Blake, I was like, yo, were mixtapes really that big? Like, you guys were just, so, like, walking around with DVDs and, and there's VHSs. Like, I think you're only, I think you're seven years younger than me. But, yeah, this is a huge gap of, like, if sure, you weren't yeah, yeah. on it in the early, late 90s, early 2000s. Like, and one had a minute. And I think and one inspired a lot of these guys, right? Uh -huh. But it was, it was a Absolutely. huge thing. Like, and one was, like, a big brand. Right. Like, I had giant baggy shorts, even though I was a hockey player. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it was a real cultural thing, man. And, and I think that's something that you've done so well in this documentary. Let's actually go to the trailer so people have an understanding of what we're talking about here. Appreciate it. Yo, there's a scene in Vancouver, and these dudes are nasty. Getting hold of the nutty, it was like gold dust. It's folklore. You know what I'm saying? Like legendary folklore. All right, is it recording yet? Yeah. You come from everybody's black to your baby, it's just me and you. My coaches tell me, you know, don't play this jungle ball. Okay, like, you don't want us to play like black people? That mixtape, it's big like wildfire. Germany, Australia, Japan. I'm gonna bust some freestyle moves coming down this court because this crowd is rowdy, dog. We were just street ball rock stars. This is the family that I never had until I didn't have it anymore, right? That's kind of why I've had a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to the two of you. People might say, well, yeah, it's a long time ago, forget what I was in the past, but it really impacted my life. It was something really different, and we got an incredible childhood out of it. I feel like I could be, come, be something great. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, wow. you, you get the sense there um, of the emotion that's packed into this because it's not just about the street ball. I mean, it's about the relationship between all these players then and through um, the 20 years. So, obviously, look, it's deeply personal to you. You're very, very close to it. But this has resonated with a lot of people. Like, this is not a documentary for a small segment of Vancouver basketball fans or even Canadian basketball fans. Um, this is big. And we know street ball culture is still you know, big around the world. Um, you know, Joey from, from the doc is out in Asia at the time. It's big in, in China. Um, but why do you think this doc and this story is resonating with people so much? Um, I think there's a bunch of reasons. I think first and foremost, uh, you know, we can't take any credit for the, the kind of 10 core guys of this crew. Just have like, and I, I hope you guys would agree with this, they have this like special charisma about them. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, I feel like if you got 10 of your high school friends together after 20 years, 
there'd be some like bad eggs and people you probably wouldn't want to talk to. And you certainly wouldn't want to put a camera on. And we got these guys together and they're just like amazing storytellers. And I think that resonates with people. And I think part of that has to do with, they kind of grew up in this hotbed of like basketball storytelling and basketball as art. So, so I think that helps. And then I think a, a big part of it's an immigrant story, mm -hmm. especially I think in Canada, I think everybody is an immigrant and everybody can relate to that to some degree. Um, it's I, it, again, I thought, I think going into it, we thought it was going to be like, uh, like a hurrah of like, look how cool these guys are and look how special some of this basketball is. And some of the stuff's never been kind of done before or since. But then when we start filming, people start crying, people start breaking down what's happened in their lives before or since for better and worse. And you're like, oh man, this kind of movie ends up being sort of about a family, like a, like an, like an effed up family. And maybe that's sort of a, a story that everybody can get behind. And then last but not least, I think like, there's a story, uh, maybe a subplot of the story that involves me and Kirk, the co-director, a little bit more. It's like a story a little bit about a reckoning of of race and privilege and, you know, who gets to tell these stories. And I think that is interesting and, and hopefully gives it another level that uh, that makes people want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, I would say if you have a serious question, because he you said something that you you teased something to me. Question, okay, ahead. no, no you go ahead. I'll come back to the to the other stuff because i'm just like i'm watching the clips and i i want to yeah no I, you I go ahead what, what's really beautiful about this because you know um especially for the two of us like we're, we're so locked in on the raptors it's like the raptors show although today we have not talked to anything raptors but hey, listen <laughs> like what do you want from us man like no one is trying to hear raptors right now um but there there is so much outside of that specific narrow lane and, and that's not to diminish anything the raptors do obviously we love it you got a poster of colin damar behind you so you know what i mean like i, I obviously know that this is a passion for you but like, ultimately, there are so many different ways that you can take basketball. And this is one of the things where every time I, I, I tap in, and again, I missed out on the hype of it, and, you know, the the, the the fashion, the culture, the significance, and that's why I'm so eager to, to dive into this. But there are so many other ways to engage with the sport of basketball and, and the ways that it can kind of create and connect community. And, and, and anytime I see that, it's beautiful. You know what I mean? And, and I could clearly tell that there is so much passion um, and so much history and so much significance and so much energy around it too. Cause it's like NBA basketball Look is just at those one thing. crowds in those clips <laughs> yeah, too, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Raptor crowds not looking like that these days. Sorry. Unless they hand out a, a Sorry, free guys. Adidas. Yeah. Shoes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, man. So, uh, okay. Jeremy, you, you mentioned some of these moves, like some of the things that the players are actually doing. You kind of teased something in me to, ta to me over text. Um, so you were involved in, in one of the moves from goosebumps that doesn't make the dock. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, were you get, like yeah. getting used as a prop? Like, you're the guy he first hits this move on, and you like, you, like your ankles get broken. What what are we talking about here? There's a there's a bit of that, but none of that is documented. There are people who look suspiciously like me getting just clowned up. <laughs> it's not me <laughs> on the record in in the Nautic too. Uh -huh. um, but there's so Goosebumps has a book of moves. If, if, if you see the the movie, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. And the the way he writes about the moves is is hysterical and lovely, and and he. A bunch of these come to fruition in ways you wouldn't you wouldn't believe. But one of the moves that's it's in the mixtape. It's just not in the documentary. It's called the two ball fool. And I always think of this as like, you know, guys were putting the ball in their shirt. They're putting it around heads. I think this was like the max street ball creativity. And any further than this, and possibly even this, you're jumping the shark. So the two ball fool is a move we went. I Kirk and I went with goosebumps to Zeller's trying to find a mini basketball, but that looked like a normal basketball, like orange, which is hard to find sometimes. And helped him, you know, that didn't help him buy it, but we're like filming him buying at the cashier. He's like, this is perfect. This is the the era. And then we used to go to these courts and the move was like, Goosebumps does a move where he puts the ball in his shirt and he pops it out and he tries to do a crossover, but he's purposely losing the ball as he does it. So that the next time he does it, he puts the ball in his shirt. When it pops around, he can't quite get it around. This is like inside street ball. But anyways, the, the basketball is behind his shirt. And I, with the camera, the camcorder, walk up behind him, pull the big ball out, and slip the small ball in <laughs> so that when he taps the ball out, a smaller ball can come out. And the guy goes to reach because he knows, oh, I'm going to get this steal from what they set up in earlier losing the ball plays. And now he's holding this tiny basketball. Goosebumps <laughs> has the rig, the real big ball, and he goes off and scores. And you can imagine the, like, 
difficulty and complexity of doing this. And also, no matter, like, these guys had a good reputation in the city. People were excited to play them. But, like, if you do that move and it doesn't work and, like, this little ball dribbles out, <laughs> yeah. we would just you're, leave. You're like, doing the middle of a... <laughs> Coyote Roadrunner basketball yeah, moves, exactly. basically. Like, an Acme Anvil got yeah. balls on him and we dunk it. And so, like, we would go do this. The mixtape's done, but we just want to get this one move on, on tape. We would go to different courts and do this in a pickup game. And if it didn't work... We would just go home, like we just pack up <laughs> in the middle of the game and just keep trying it until we finally landed it, and then we're just like, you know, tears of joy, going like, okay, <laughs> the mixtape is done. So yeah, just uh, and again, like you can't go past that. <laughs> That's the max. Um, we only got a, a minute left with you here. Um, so uh, music is a big part of this as well, right? The street ball is you know connecting with basketball culture the same in a similar way at a similar time as hip hop did. Um, the the documentary is scored incredibly well. It, it music's a huge part of the documentary. And RZA is an EP, uh, so I gotta ask: like, did you did you get to meet RZA? Like, are you are you unofficially in the Wu Tang Clan at this point? Like, what what was RZA's involvement? So I didn't get to meet RZA, but I think I am unofficially in the Wu Tang Clan. Okay, I don't know great. How that, that works. But, um, uh, Chris Paul, uh, Shay, yeah. Lou Dort, they're all EPs on this as well, right? Yeah, Chris Paul came on first, and then he was like, "Hey, I have some friends in Oklahoma, uh, from OKC that are uh, Canadian basketball guys. Why don't they come on?" And we're just like, "What? How is this happening?" So, <laughs> so yeah, all those guys come on and and really repped it. Uh, the music in it, I got to shout out. Amir says nothing. A bunch of the best hip hop in it. Yeah, really, really proud of the music in the movie. Awesome. Well, uh, in addition, so uh, one other thing we wanted to mention is that uh, King Handles, who's a figure in the documentary, has his School of Handles basketball camps out in Vancouver and from scanning the Instagram and stuff, it's like, hey, keep this part of the culture alive and inject it into actual basketball uh, or uh, traditional basketball uh, a little bit too. So people can check out school, uh, King Handles School of Handles basketball camps as well. Um, this documentary is handled with care. The legend of the Nautic Streetball crew. You are Jeremy Shalin Ryu. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time, man. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Of course, thank you. All right, Jeremy Shalin Ryu, Handle with yes. Care. It's, it's out, out on Apple TV, uh, YouTube, Pretty much anywhere you can you can yeah. get documentaries. It, it did the film festival tour. It's it's tremendous, and Jeremy does uh, Jeremy and Kirk do a, a great job with it. And it's just so creative, man. And I, I think you know for NBA basketball, we're so concerned with like how do we get from point A to point B, being like how do we compete at the very highest level, get the most results. We're playing this like super strict basketball where it's like you, you go to the park and the playground, like people aren't just like camped out in the corners ready to space out. You know what I mean? Like, people are trying to, like, pull off moves. Yeah. And there's an element of creativity, and it's like, you don't necessarily have to go from point A to point B. It's almost like, in a way, like, like skateboarding in a way. Like, you know, how many points can you get for tricks? And, like, that's for me is, like, it's a, it's a, it's the same sport, but it's at the same time, you're, you're doing it in a much more beautiful way. It's almost like wrestling versus, like, pro wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, I, no one watches, pro, like, serious wrestling unless it's at the Olympics or something. Yeah. I'm but ready. like people love pro wrestling, you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. Know, so anyway, no, it's great. it's just great to see the whole community around us. So yeah, great. congrats to Jeremy and his whole crew. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and Jeremy's the best as well. Like he he directs a bunch of music videos. Mm -hmm. He's directed feature stuff. He's like been nominated for Junos multiple times. Uh, the music he directed me in the pop music video that I was in. Um, <laughs> oh, now so we know it, why this happened. If we had more time, I, I was going to get him to share just how terrific an actor I am, etc. Um, <laughs> but it is time now for Between the Lines, brought yes. to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. The Raptors hosting the Lakers. They are twelve point underdogs. The yeah. over under is at two thirty two and a half. Gary Trent will sit out tonight uh, for rest. R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly are both probable oh, to make great. their returns. Uh, everyone else who's been out, including Ochai, remain out on the Lakers side. Uh, Gabe Vincent, Christian Wood, Jared Vanderbilt, Cam Reddish, Jalen Hood, Sufino, all out, and LeBron and AD are questionable. Despite all that, Lakers have won six of seven. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, we, we just had that conversation with NYQ about this, but I, I do kind of expect them to play. I mean, if at all possible, they still need to get these results. You know what I mean? And, and the Lakers are... Not just in the play-in, but it's, like, very important to know that, like, 9 is way better than being in 10. And 8 is way much better than being in 9, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, just based on how the play-in works. So the Lakers have lots of incentive. So I, I'm really hoping to see both of them take the court. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very happy to hear that RJ and Quickly are closer to being able to play. Hopefully we see them tonight. Um, and if we do, then we'll actually have something to really talk about tomorrow on the show. But... In the meantime, yeah, I don't think you could pick anything in favor of the Raptors when it comes to basketball. No, that was Between the Lines, <laughs> brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Yeah. Uh, make sure you tune into once If you tune out at halftime, tune into Handle with Care. <laughs> Go stream that with your second halftime 
uh, instead. There you go. Okay. That's the first today. I've been your host, Wolo. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's New Chucky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Thanks to our producer, Ahmed Mon, our board producer, Lance Kennedy, Jennifer Olnick David, says Jeremy Anita, helping behind the scenes. Thanks to our guests today, Dan Waiki and Jeremy Shalin Ryu. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow.